Good evening. Uh, welcome. It's good to have you. Uh, I'm Matthew Spaulding. I'm the Associate Vice President and Dean for Hillsdale College here in Washington, D.C. Uh, welcome to the Allen P. Kirby Center for Constitutional Studies and Citizenship, which is our forward deployment of Hillsdale College uh, in the nation's capital. Uh, Hillsdale College, as most of you know, is an old institution based in Michigan, founded in 1844, that from the beginning was anti-slavery and opened its door to all regardless of race, religion, or sex. And today it remains vigorously independent, among other things, not accepting any government money. Um, and the reason we do that is to maintain our independence so that we can remain a trustee of the Western philosophical and theological inheritance, tracing to Athens and Jerusalem, uh, which we believe find its clearest expression in the American idea, in the American experiment. Our mission is to teach those ideas, and it follows that we have always been less interested in labels and isms like conservatism and more interested in thoughts and actions of politics. We'd rather focus on conserving the liberating principles of the American Revolution, for instance. And so we teach about politics, constitutionalism, and the prudence of statecraft, uh, which is what we will be teaching at a graduate school. We will soon be opening here in Washington, D.C. to teach those things. Um, our speaker today is uh, Michael Anton, who is a lecturer and research fellow here at the Kirby Center. He received his BA from the University of California, Davis, a Master's of Liberal Arts degree from St. John's College in Annapolis, and a Master's degree in Government from the Claremont Graduate University. Prior to joining Hillsdale College, he served in the Trump administration as Deputy Administ uh, Assistant to the President for Strategic Communications. Uh, he's written for numerous publications, many of uh, uh, which you've uh, seen uh, some famous, some infamous, I suppose, including the uh, Washington Post, the Journal, Wall Street Journal, Weekly Standard, and I know he's also a senior fellow at the Claremont Institute. Uh, his topic this evening, uh, the, the topic this evening, uh, the end of conservatism and the re rebirth of politics. Mike Anton. kind of scary. It reminds me of Peggy Noonan's little book on speech writing, and she said that people's number one fear typically is public speaking. Um, I've actually had to do it a lot over the last year and a half or so, and uh, I thought it had gotten kind of easy, you know, nothing to worry about, and so I asked Matt, well, what do you, you want to like script something out or just get up there and wing it, because that's what I've been doing lately. And he's like, you don't have to script it out, but you don't really want to wing it either, so I wrote an outline. <laughs> um, Matt actually came up with the title. Um, uh, I, I had come up, I had came up with something incredibly witty, like uh, the proper relationship between the general and the particular, and I sent that to him. And he wrote back an email, I can't remember, he spelled out the word, I can't remember if it was groan or yawn, but it was one or the other. And so I said, all right, I gotta do some, think of something else then. And he said, what about this? That's good, that's good, that works, I can, I can talk about that. Um, open with a little warning, um, one of my favorite teacher is not a teacher because I never knew him, but I read all his books and you know, studied his arguments with care. Leo Strauss said, I think it's in a letter somewhere, he said, you should, the title of a book or a piece or an article should never reflect what's actually in the contents. Um, you need to let the reader figure that out for himself. So I'll leave it to you to figure out whether I actually do talk about the end of conservatism and the return of politics. One of the things you learn from Strauss is um, you read all the Platonic dialogues and they're all uh, centered around a what is question, right? So of course that's where we have to start. What is conservatism? I use Lincoln's definition from the, well, I'll tell you where it's from, actually, I'm getting ahead of my own outline. What is conservatism, said Lincoln, is it not the adherence to the old and tried against the new and untried? It's a decent definition, I would say, but notice what Lincoln does not say there. He doesn't say conservatism is true. He doesn't say it's good. He doesn't say it's right. He doesn't say it's just. He doesn't say it isn't any of these things either, but he doesn't evaluate conservatism at all. He just sort of tells you what, uh, what it's trying to do in terms of uh, newness and oldness, right? So I would say we have to step back. Conservatism can't really be in itself a, a governing or guiding principle for what we're trying to do. You know, for instance, oldness. It's the old and tried, right? Well, um, as a graduate student friend of mine once said in a seminar that got incredibly heated, um, but in a good way. He said, you know what, second only to the family, slavery is the oldest human institution in the world. We wouldn't say it's good, right? 
As for it's being tried in Lincoln's terms, we know it works. I put that in quotes. For the, this is for the C-SPAN audience. Um, it's good. It, it, it works for the slaveholder, right? Old and tried, therefore, there cannot be a standard for the good. What's Lincoln doing here? He's using rhetoric. He's appealing to a popular prejudice. The quote comes from the Cooper Union speech, which if you've not read it, I urge everyone to read it. It's very long, complicated. Um, it's not his greatest speech. It's not his most stirring, but it's his most intellectually impressive. His law partner said in both awe and lament, because I think he thought it cost them a lot of money because Lincoln wasn't really working, that it, he spent the better part of a year working on it. So at the time, the speech was given in uh, February of 1860, before uh, Lincoln's election to president, but it's essentially made him the Republican nominee. His Republican Party was being accused of radicalism in seeking to keep slavery out of the territories. So they were being called the anti-conservatives. They're the rabble-rousers, the agitators, right? His great opponent, Lincoln's that is, in 1858 and 60, Stephen Douglas, appealed to the founders in support of his position that slavery should be subject to a majority vote. Um, Douglas said something like that. We, we should govern ourselves in this matter as in all matters, as did our forefathers before us. So Lincoln said, okay, I'm going to put that to the test. I'm going to go research what they actually thought on this question. He delved through tons of archives in every single place where a vote was taken on the question of federal authority to exclude slavery from the territories. He found that a, a majority, in most cases a supermajority of those founders who placed a vote said, we have the power to keep it out, right? So Lincoln turns Douglas's argument back against itself. He destroys Douglas's appeal to the founders. They're both making the same appeal. We're going back. We're the conservatives. I'm the conservative. You know, Lincoln's saying I'm the conservative. You're saying you're the conservative. Well, who's really right on this question? Turns, um, the argument is rhetorically brilliant, I would argue, but intellectually limited, right? What is the American founding? Is it not the new and the untried in a certain respect? You know, they, the founders, of, they called it an, an experiment. Um, they used the Latin phrase, novus ordo seclorum, a new order for the ages. Is there a conservatism that must be open to risk and to the new? I would argue that of course there should be. And I don't think Lincoln disagreed with me. What he's doing in that speech is rhetoric. That's not an adequate, that may be an adequate definition of conservatism, but it shows the limits of what conservatism is or what it can do. So I'm gonna mention Strauss again. I think I'm gonna mention him at least one more time, just letting you know um, after this. He taught that philosophy is the awareness of permanent problems. And one such is the inherent tension between the right and the just on the one hand and, and adventurism or newness on the other. The Declaration of Independence, I'm gonna give you a fairly long quote, but I think it's very important. It says, prudence indeed will dictate that governments long established should not be changed for light and transient causes. And accordingly, all experience hath shown that mankind are more disposed to suffer evils while evils are sufferable than to right themselves by abolishing the forms to which they are accustomed. So the point here is, if you go too far in one direction, you get stasis and injustice forever. Do you just accept injustice and, and wrong because conservatism is old and tried and anything new is radical? Um, you go too far in the other direction, you get utopianism. Every evil must be righted. Every problem is urgent. We gotta do it right now. And whatever china and eggs we have to break, it's, it's, it's not only is the cost worth it, but there's almost a moral necessity to doing it, right? The only solution here is prudence. You gotta know what to do in, in a given circumstance. The American founders, you know, you could make a case either way. Was, it, was, it, was the, I, um, did they need to do what they did when they did it? They had to argue about that. There were people who didn't want to do it. There were people who didn't want the revolution. And they made good arguments. I'm not saying they were right. They made good arguments. It's not obvious. It requires prudence. Prudence requires knowing the good, which requires philosophy. In other words, conservatism has to look up to something above itself. The question of what it conserves absolutely matters. Conservatism today, when I now, from, from this point on, when I say conservatism, you know, you put that in quote, I'm, I mean kind of a, an, a, an ideology, a mindset, in some respects, an industry. Conservatism likes to say that it has a philosophy. I also have that in quotes. But once you put an article in front of the world, and what, in other words, once you say a philosophy or the philosophy, you know, the philosophy of so-and-so, you've changed the meaning of the word. Philosophy literally means love of wisdom. It's a process of reasoned investigation that never ends. When you say, I have a philosophy, you're implying that the investigation is over, that you've figured everything out. But have you really? Um, just want to describe a scene from a book that I love that I urge you all to read. It's called The Education of Cyrus by Xenophon. And it's the story of the founder of the Persian Empire, Cyrus the Great, although all the biographical details are made up because Xenophon's really not trying to tell you the biography of the founder of the Persian Empire. He's trying to teach political lessons. So 
Young Cyrus has a political project. He wants to take Persia and make it into something else, make it bigger, grander, better, richer, more powerful. And he runs into the conservatism of the Persian peers, including his own family, who are the constitutional monarchs. They don't have a lot of power. They're sort of um, like a constitutional monarch today, uh, symbols of, of the principles of the regime. So as he's going out on his project, he has a conversation with his father. And in this conversation, by the way, book one, chapter six, if you want to read the conversation, which I recommend. He, he essentially says, I know what I'm doing, Dad. I know what the good is. I know what this project entails. Don't worry about it. Everything's going to be fine. And his father's kind of a stand-in for Socrates in this conversation. He pokes holes in all Cyrus's arguments and kind of shows that he doesn't really know. He's not sure Cyrus is wrong, but Cyrus doesn't really know, and he has not examined his own case for what the good is. Okay? But this points to another one of those insoluble problems or tensions. How do you act when you don't know what to do, when you don't know what is the good? Right? So famously, Socrates uh, always claimed that he only had knowledge of ignorance. Fundamentally, the only no true knowledge he had was knowledge of ignorance. He spent a whole lifetime investigating the noble and the good and the just, and he claimed that as he died, he still didn't know what it was, 70 years old. Then again, if you never act until you know, you'll never act. Paralysis. You know, an analogy that I've used, which is glib, but therefore not therefore inaccurate, is you can't have a dialectic about the noble of the good when a tank is coming at you. You gotta do something. You either gotta get out of the way or try to stop the tank, All right? So, the important thing, though, for, I just, I wrote here, study the good. I'm trying to, that's a little bit glib. What I meant, what I mean to say at this point is, you have to study the good, even with full knowledge and awareness that you may never get to a completely adequate understanding. If Socrates didn't, then we probably won't either. But the fact that you never get to a full and adequate analysis, a proof of what the good is, doesn't mean you uh, no longer have an obligation to study it, nor does it mean you can't ever figure out anything about what it is. The lesson from Socrates and from other philosophers is to be humble about what you think you know, be open to change. There's a famous quote often attributed to Lincoln, and I looked it up thinking it was Lincoln, and I was gonna quote it as Lincoln, but apparently nobody can prove where it came from. Uh, it might have been John Maynard Keynes. We don't even know that either. <laughs> But it's good, it's a good quote, it fits the purpose, right? When the facts change, I change my mind. What do you do, right? So when conservatives say they have a philosophy, what they really mean is that they have an ideology. And some even use the phrase ideology in an unironic and positive way. Maybe it's one of those words that's morphed over time. But initially, it kind of, it, it meant something, um, something lower, something kind of degraded than philosophy. What an ideology is is a kind of popular philosophy which presents conclusions that philosophy leaves open. So the, the true philosopher, of course, disdains ideology. Um, but ideology is fine as long as we recognize it for what it is, for its limitations. I would say it's even necessary as a practical way to solve the what now problem. In any political situation, in any situation, you've got to deliberate about what to do. We're not allowed to just step back and say, well, you know, since I can't make up my mind, let's just not do anything. Life doesn't work that way. So we need an ideology, but it always has to be open to revision, and that's where I think conservatism lost its way. Now, I'll just say this following. I'm not on Twitter. I, I intend never to be on Twitter. If you ever find me on Twitter, come to my house and shoot me. Um, <laughs> quill pens, inkwells, and parchment are my speed when it comes to information technology, but I do know what a hashtag is. And if there were one hashtag to define conservatism over the last decade at least, maybe longer, it would be hashtag capital A, always 1980. Now, I have nothing against 1980. It was a good year for me personally. I was 10, so I couldn't vote. But, and I knew nothing about politics, but I, I later learned and came to appreciate Reagan and looked back with fondness that he won the 1980 election, that he rebuilt the military, that he cut taxes, that he jump-started the American economy. All that stuff I think is good. Um, but, Reagan's policy solutions were carefully designed and calibrated for his time by Reagan himself. There's a, I just, I don't have this here, but this is as a little aside. You know, one of the, the, the most famous quote from Reagan's um, first inaugural is, um, government is not the solution to our problems. Government is the problem. Everybody cuts out, there's a parent, there's a phrase before a comma right in front of that, in this present crisis, in this present crisis, right? In other words, that's not a mantra for all time. Not a mantra for every crisis, and it, maybe it's not a mantra for non-crises. Anyway, conservatism came to believe that, that Reagan's policies would work for all time were timeless. Some probably are, but not all. And then there's the matter of priorities. When the top marginal tax rate is 70%, as it was in 1980, and tax cuts are a very high priority. When they're in the 30s, not so much. Or if you want, 
Instead of 1980, you can pick 1955. Why do I choose that? Because it's the year of the foundation of National Review. What, what does National Review do? Uh, fundamentally, no, you, you, you laugh. I'm not here to bury or criticize National Review. Uh, it's certainly not in its 1955 dispensation. Um, uh, <laughs> what did National Review, well, I mean, Buckley's big achievement there, aside from giving a voice and a venue uh, to writers who didn't have um, uh, really an outlet, was to see these disparate threads that had maybe, that weren't talking to each other, but maybe had something in common and put them together. This came to be called fusionism, right? And the three threads were the traditional religious slash conservatives who were, who were very concerned with morality, the economic conservatives and the libertarians, and the foreign policy hawks. Um, again, necessary to do for its time. Um, and a spectacular achievement, in fact. Um, so I'm not here to criticize them, I'm here to criticize us. And yes, that includes me. I was once a movement conservative, just like a lot of people in this room, maybe most of the people in this room. So this is very much a self-criticism. My point is that, the, that Reagan, Buckley, these people who met, and Lincoln, the people who met the crises of their time did what the conservative movement, as I've seen it, hasn't been able to do in the last 10 or 20 years. Um, that is, they went to a reservoir of deeper ideas and they used them to examine their own time. What did Lincoln do? He went back to the founding. The, founding were asking fund the founders were asking fundamental questions. What is the purpose of politics? What is the good society? What does justice require? What is justice itself? Um, I want to tell a very short anecdote there. So, um, you know, I said every platonic dialogue is a what is question. That's, of course, the question of the republic. What is justice? So when um, Harvey Mansfield was teaching at Berkeley in the early 60s, and Leo Strauss spent a sem semester at uh, Stanford, um, people who knew both of them, Harry Jaffa in particular, said, you gotta, you gotta go see this guy every, you know, as much as you can. And so Mansfield would drive across the bay and see Strauss every weekend, they'd read The Republic, and with some other students. And like one of the first things Strauss apparently asked him was, what is the theme, what is the question at the center of this dialogue? And the room is silent, and they're all like, he's too important, like what if I get the wrong answer in front of this brilliant man? Nobody talked, like clock ticked by, and finally Mansfield said, what is justice? And so I was like, yes, that's the right answer. And he felt so relieved. I got the right answer. <laughs> this genius recognizes that I got the right answer. It was an easy question. He thought maybe there was a trick in there somewhere. OK, we, we go back to the founding, we get fundamental questions. So we go back to 1980, what do we get? We get tax cuts, enterprise zones, small government, and be tough on the Russians. Not that these are bad things, but they don't address the fundamental issues of 2016 or 2018. So I'm going to give you another quote. This is the chapter title of Book three, chapter one of the Discourses of Machiavelli. It is entitled, if one wishes a sect or a republic to live long, it is necessary to draw it back often toward its beginnings. I'm not gonna tell you what he really means by that, but it's a lot, because it's a lot meaner than it sounds. Um, but, you know, for, the, for conservatives, the beginning is 1980 or maybe 1955. For some, I think it even moved further forward in time. I mean, there's a, there's a pretty big wing of the conservative movement which now would say the whole 1980 platform is much too mean and harsh. You know, they maybe point to compassionate conservative of 2000. You know, one of the things conservatism has done lately is it's jettisoned a lot of what is best in its useful past. Okay? So I would say the real beginning for us is the founders, the founding, the American founding, and the principles which underlay it, which some of which are contemporary to its time, some of which uh, belong to the early modern period, some of which go all the way back to the classical area. Um, now, conservatives all agree. They say they all agree. The one thing they will say they all agree on is they love the founding. I love the founding. But like Cyrus and the good in a conversation with his father, they think they understand it. But I question whether they really do. Now, this is another Strauss quote. I think this is the last one. He wrote a book in 1949 called On Tyranny. 1949 is four years after the end of World War II. Stalin has conquered half of Europe. He's a very bad man. And Russian, uh, the Soviet Empire is going strong. Strauss writes an analysis of tyranny. And he makes an indictment against his fellow political scientists. He says, when we were brought face to face with tyranny, with a kind of tyranny that surpassed the boldest imagination of the most powerful thinkers of the past, our political science failed to recognize it. He's essentially saying, if you're a doctor and I bring into you a terminal cancer patient, you can't even tell me that he has cancer, then you don't know what you're doing. Well, I would flip that onto the conservatives. The American people were presented with the most conservative, founder-like presidential candidate in a generation. Our conservatives failed to recognize it. Now that's people that's gonna sound crazy. Trump is the least conservative Republican ever. 
It deviates from these principles all across the board. How can you say that? Well, what do you think the founding is about? I think I know what's in the head. I'm going to guess at what's in the heads of a lot of the people in this room. Liberty, freedom, rights, equality, constitution. All those are essential, no doubt about it. But the, real, the core of the founding, what the founders are trying to do, is protection. The protection of rights, the protection of person, the protection of property, protection of the country itself, of the physical country itself, of its communities, of its industries, and so on. If we go back to the founding, the pre-founding beginning, the true beginning, we find a fundamental, another fundamental philosophic distinction. It's that between mere life and the good life. You can't have the latter without the former, and the founders understood this. I'll just make a small aside, which I left out because it goes down kind of a rabbit hole, but you know, this is one of those ancients and modern distinctions is, the, the ancients and the moderns would say, of course, have to have mere life. The basis of protection is fundamental. No, no disagreement there. Um, how much does the state or the polis or whatever get involved in the good life? And the ancients would say a lot, right? <laughs> Maybe almost overwhelmingly. Um, so there's a line floating around out there that came up on an email list I'm on that goes something like the ancient formula is anything the law does not command, it forbids. Whereas the modern formula is anything the law does not forbid, it permits. Okay? Founders would say the state should have a lot less, it should leave you free to pursue the good life, have a lot less involvement, but not zero involvement. They were not libertarians. Um, they, they, you know, they, they were strongly for laws inculcating virtue, promoting religion, and so on and so forth. Okay. Now, no, I'm not saying that our conservatives would deny any of this. They wouldn't. They'd say, of course. Yeah. Yeah. Duh. And I'm going to give them credit. They've done some great work on this theme. Uh, in particular, I mean, what movement has done more to protect lives, property, and society than the, the great crime-fighting movement that was essentially launched by conservative intellectuals? Manhattan Institute, and put in place by conservative mayors and governors since the late 80s and early 90s. It's one of the great conservative policy success stories of my lifetime, maybe the single greatest. But conservatism failed to protect us in three fundamental ways, uh, on immigration, trade, and foreign policy. Now, this is not a policy speech. I'm not going to go into this in great detail, although I'm sure you'll all have questions and I'll happy to answer them. Um, and I do have strong thoughts on all three. But I, I mostly want to answer why. Why didn't they recognize it? So yet another philosophic distinction, that between the form and the matter. Okay? In political terms, the form is the regime or the principle. The matter is the people, the land, the stuff, the buildings, the industries, the resources. There's a, there's a line in Francis Bacon when he, he quotes the dangers of a little philosophy. A little philosophy doth incline men's minds to atheism, but depth in the subject bringeth them back around to God. I think that's exact. I'm not sure I didn't write it down. So conservatives, they got a little philosophy about first principle, and they fell in love with it. And essentially what I think happened is they sloganized the founding principles. They love to quote the Declaration. We all quote the Declaration, but we only quote the second paragraph. Everybody, we all these truths be self-evident. Everybody knows the second paragraph. Do you know the first paragraph? I'll read it. When in, no, and when, when you hear me like emphasize my voice and sort of yell a little, that means it's bolded on the, on the page, right? <laughs> when in the course of human events, it becomes necessary for one people to dissolve the political bands which have connected them with another, and to assume among the powers of the earth the separate and equal station to which the laws of nature and nature's God entitle them, a decent respect to the opinions of mankind require that they should declare the causes which impel them to that separation. So what is the founding, fundamentally, or at least at a basic level? It's when we declared ourselves a people. The principles of paragraph two are declared to be true for all mankind, but the founders would not pretend that they had the power to apply them to all mankind. Nor would they say, even if they had that power, that they had any right to do so. Remember, the separate and equal station. It's right there in paragraph one. Nations are entitled to a separate and equal station, entitled by nature and, nations, nature and nature's God. Lincoln called the second paragraph, Lincoln famously referred to the declaration itself as a merely revolutionary document. It's just stating a fact. We could, and he says, absolutely could have written that document without the second paragraph at all. Didn't have to put any political theory in it. But it's there to state for all time the basis of political legitimacy. This is how we, how we define justice and how we base legitimacy in our regime going forward. It will no longer be on the divine right of kings or aristocratic principles or any of the things that prevailed in the Europe at the time. And Lincoln also said that statement was in there in order to be forever a stumbling block to future tyrants and future oppression. That it would, that it would galvanize the minds of the people and make them aware or more aware and more apt to fight back should such uh, uh, oppressors arise. 
So I would say the reason the conservatives missed the Trump phenomena is because they don't really understand trade and immigration, which is because they don't understand first principle. Or maybe they forgot, I don't know. I'm, trying, I'm being a little more generous. Uh, they recoil at any talk as Americans as a separate people because they think this violates some first principle. Now that's maybe a little bit of an overstatement, but it's getting more radical out there, I think, with the immigration debate. They forgot the proper relationship of the general, the form, to the particular matter. So there, I got my title in my lecture in anyway. So on this question, the ancients, under, the ancients understand Plato and Aristotle and the founders, they, they agree. There's only one best regime. It's true for all times and places. It's not always practicable, meaning possible to set up, uh, or even if you could set it up to make it last. And in fact, it very rarely will be practicable. It's practicability, practicability depends on the matter, whether the given matter is capable of sustaining it. You all know the very famous Ben Franklin quote. Walks out of the Constitutional Convention. What did you give us, Mr. Franklin? A monarchy or a republic? He says, a republic if you can keep it. That's an awareness of the importance of matter to the regime, that the form the matter has to fit the form and vice versa. The fact that there are universal truths does not obviate another fact, namely that all politics is inherently particular. There will always be separate cities, nations, and countries entitled to separate and equal stations. Um, one of the points of the Syropedia is to you know, point out the limits of that understanding. Essentially, Xenophon, just like Plato in the Republic, is making this sort of the same point. Ultimately, the distinction between Citizen and non-citizen may be arbitrary in the sense that you know, where the line is drawn, there's not always a clear line. But that there will always be a line is a fundamental fact of human nature, which is why one world government is both impossible and undesirable. Now, this may definitely be, this is definitely glib, and it may be slightly unfair, but not therefore wholly inaccurate. I think the, conserv the conservatives allowed their misunderstanding of form to convince them that principle requires globalization. We are all Tom Friedman now in the conservative movement. Certainly, they think it requires free trade. Um, I think there's some economic principle that absolutely requires free trade, and protection is the worst thing you could possibly do, and it's almost an affront to the national dignity of, I don't know, every American. But this is kind of hilarious. The very first law the United States Congress passed after it became operational was the Tariff Act of 1789. Now, I, it wasn't exactly the first law. They passed a couple of sort of housekeeping managerial laws, but the first substantive law they passed was the Tariff Act of 1789. You can't appeal to Lincoln either. It was a thoroughgoing protectionist, and the entire Lincoln inspired Republican Party that dominated American politics from 1865 until the Progressive Era was also protectionist. So I'm not denouncing free trade. I'm saying it's a policy. It depends on the context. There are times in which it's good for us, and there are times in which maybe it doesn't work out. It certainly worked out extremely well for the United States from 1945 to 1965. Maybe you can stretch that 75. Actually, Reagan understood the dangers of free trade better than the conservatives today who appealed to him and uh, introduced a number of protectionist measures and, and arguably saved the US auto industry by um, doing things to the Japanese auto industry that conservatives today would find completely anathema. The founders on immigration, similar. They knew it depended on the context. In the founding era, you see a lot of arguments from leading founders saying, we have this giant continent. We didn't have the whole continent yet, but if you think about it, I think on the eve of the revolution in 13 colonies, there are about 3 million people. And they said, that's not enough people. We can't even hold it. We can't hold this land with that people. We need more people for our own safety and security, they made this argument. Immigration's good for the existing citizenry. Let's welcome in some people. But they're asking the right question. Do we, the people, need more people? Sometimes we do, right? The failure to understand principle, I would argue, also has real rhetorical implications. Uh, I'm hearing this more and more from conservatives. Anytime you bring up the particular, they immediate, their immediate go-to, it's like a, just a gut reaction or a rash or something, is identity politics, and that's bad. That's what the left does, it's bad. Only talk about universals. Anytime you talk about anything particular and not universal, you're engaging in identity politics. This misunderstanding of principle, I think, is weaponized by the left and used against the conservatives. And they still haven't really caught on. I, I, I caught on. I'm trying to help them. They don't want to hear it. You can trust me. Um, your principles mean that, the left will say to them, your principles mean that you must be for open borders. And they'll go, they don't want to believe, you know, but they, they think, they tie themselves in knots trying to think of a principled answer or they give in and agree. The founders would just simply say, what are you talking about, right? We, the people, get to decide that. That's the principle of republicanism. The founders would also say, and this is an argument the conservatives really get super upset about, is that it depends on the matter or the suitability for republicanism of the people you're admitting. They make this argument very openly. We're doing an experiment, right? Remember when the founders found the United States of America, the last, there's really only one, arguably one, arguably two, I would say, successful republics in the world at that time. 
um, Switzerland or the Swiss Confederacy in the, in the Netherlands. And the Netherlands is nominally ruled by a Habsburg monarch out of Madrid. Uh, so the, and, and so the last experience that the, uh, the West had with republics would be the Renaissance. And they were all disasters. The founders have to make, this is what Federalists 1 through 6 is, made them making a case for why republicanism is not a complete failure in, in human terms, but it can be revived, and it ought to be revived. But then they say, if it's going to be sustained, we have to make sure that the character of the people remains republican, which they say has a lot to do with what we're going to do on, immigra on, sorry, on education policy, but on immigration policy. Well, conservatives cannot bear that thought. Um, they think it's ruled out by their principles, and as a result, they concede a huge amount of vital ground to the left, and they lose arguments, which I think they, we have been doing for a while. Another way we lose is to accept the tyranny of expertise. Um, the modern left, drawing from Hegel and others, asserts that there are no fundamentally political questions. That is, just questions to which there's no necessary right or wrong answer. Or the, that is to say, correct or incorrect answer. There might be a right or wrong answer. There are only issues or problems, you know, that are correct or, or incorrect. And naturally, the left has all the solutions. And they have the research university, which I analogize to the pre-revolutionary monasteries of France, which Napoleon spent a serious amount of time and effort breaking up for good reason. Um, uh, and and, and it's, it's, the analogy is more apt than you think. I mean, they're, they're rich. I didn't coin this term, but I wish I had. But these, and, and, I mean, I'm, I'm all for Hillsdale's endowment. May it, may it grow in perpetuity. But uh, uh, colleges that are teaching bad things and doing bad things to the to society, I mean, you know, we have to recognize they're, they're hedge funds with these little schools attached. And, and, they're t and, and another analogy to uh, pre-revolutionary France, you remember, remember one of the reasons that uh, the French Revolution happened is because the nobility didn't have to pay taxes. The richest people in the society didn't have to pay taxes. The universities don't pay taxes. The guys who manage their hedge funds pay the, the so-called two and 20. No, sorry, the investor pays that. Uh, and they carried interest loopholes. So they make a lot of money and they don't have to pay uh, ordinary income tax on it. I call that the tax-exempt nobility. It's certainly the tax-privileged nobility. It's not good. Okay, too, too, so conservatism too often foolishly accepts this, that okay, uh, all these are questions of expertise, so we just have to come up with a better argument. Well, we're gonna do a better policy paper, we're gonna run the numbers, we're gonna win, so then our, our expertise will get to decide the solution. But that's not the game the left is playing against them. I don't think they realize it. It's the game they tell us they're playing, and then I think we are dumb enough to believe it. We're losing the rhetorical war because we don't understand first principle. We don't know how to apply principle to the challenges of our time. And, we, and because we came to mistake policies for principles. Now, almost done. There is a conservative reaction against this, which I think is healthy and good, but it's inchoate. And it's, there's a problem at its core, which is that the people who see the problems with current, or a lot of them, who see the problems with current conservatism, say that the problem is the principle, right? They just equate principles with universalism, and they say, so the solution is just to abandon principle, and we're just gonna go back to the particular altogether. Um, it always tramples the particular. I first say, first of all, that's logically not true. I could explain it, but it would take, there's a, there's a bit of a proof, it takes a bit, so I'll skip that. Uh, but also, this is important, the founders didn't believe that, right? So to those in the, the traditionalist right, or whatever you want to call them, who invoke American history, customs, traditions, et cetera, I sympathize. I, I want to preserve all of those things, too. Fundamental question, what is conservatism trying to conserve? Those are some of the things conservatism ought to be trying to conserve. But tradition fundamentally is about the passion of love of one's own. This is the problem with traditionalism, is it, doesn't, it can't give you an account of why tradition is good. Some traditions are good. We should defend them on that basis. But if you don't know what the good is, or have I have no idea what the good is, or if you deny the existence of the good, you have no basis on which to say tradition is good. That's not my point here, though. My point is the founding is, if love of one's own is the passion that the traditionalists want to take us back to, away from some sort of radical particularism, well, the founding is our own. So it's self-contradictory to denounce the founding principles or principles in general, and then say you want to appeal to America. It's also self-defeating and unnecessary, and then say, you oh, know, but we want to appeal to America, and what, what America is what we're trying to save. All right, so everybody, you're always supposed to close, and what do we do now? Um, to which I would say, I don't know. But I have some answers. <laughs> the first task is to understand principle correctly, and that's within reach. We can do it, because there's books out there that explain it, and there's teachers who know it. There's no reason why we have to get first principle in such a mess. There's no reason for it. Uh, at least, there's no reason why we can't clean that up. That's achievable, and it's achievable in the near term. The second is to just not be afraid. Once we learn the principles, stop conceding rhetorical ground to the left as if they understand our principles better than we do, and keep losing. 
The third is we need to have honest debates amongst ourselves about how to apply um, principle to policy. And we have to recognize that those debates are political debates. They're not debates about expertise, about correct and false. They are in a philosophic and perhaps theological sense debates about right and wrong. But we need to understand that in a sense the political sphere has been either taken away from us or vastly constricted and we need to get it back. So we can look to the founders for the first task for sure. We can look to the founders for the second, be not afraid and fight back. We can't really look to them for the third. Uh, we can't, their ideas will not supply us with recipes for today's use. Only we living today can possibly find a solution to the problems of today. But they can give us the basis on which to find those solutions, and that's where we need to start looking. And I think ultimately, that's why I'm here at Hillsdale, working here now, dream job, very happy to be here. Look forward to doing it for many years to come. Um, I think that's what the college is trying to do in a broad sense. And I would include in all of that, which I left out of the talk specifically, but not just America, but the, the whole West. The whole West. The whole civilizational project of the West is what we're trying to conserve, fight for, correctly understand. It's, you know, whether we're going to win, we can win the argument. We're going to win the fight. I don't know. But um, I'll, I'll quote, I didn't write this part down, but I will quote Machiavelli one more time. He lays out the sort of fundamental alternative between two courses of action in Discourses Book 1, Chapter 6. And he says, like, reason can't really make a case for either one of these. You, you know, you could, you, you could argue this, you could argue that. It's got a strong case for and against for both of them. So he says, take the honorable course and do this one. Take the honorable course and fight, even if you, even if you think you're going to lose. I'll end there. Mr. Anton, thank you so much for coming and speaking. Uh, definitely, thank you again. Or what I want to ask about is you mentioned Mr. Lincoln. Mr. Lincoln was someone who said that Henry Clay was his beau of an ideal statesman. And yet, Henry Clay would have been horrified by the Homestead Act that Mr. Lincoln signed. It's contrary to his policy of how to form land in the West. So my question is, in terms of in the administration of public policy from a perspective of conservatism, but moreover, uh, trueness to first principles, when does one, in a sense, change one's principles, not prince, change principles, sorry, change how one's planned to administer and work within government versus what is the plans of the times? I'm not sure I understood the question. Um, but I'll give you a little, I'll give you a little auto, pseudo autobiographical account. I was always a free trader. I thought the conservative principle demanded it. It's what I, I didn't study much economics, but what I studied seemed like, you know, as a matter of expertise, free trade is superior, and as a matter of justice, it's required. Um, I took that view into 2015. And all of a sudden, here comes along a presidential candidate who I liked what he was saying on immigration for sure, and he made sense to me on foreign policy, but I thought, oh, he's, on trade, he's terrible, he's nuts. He made me go back and rethink it and look it up. Just try to figure something out, right? Revisit the arguments. He, turned, he changed my mind on trade, or he, he led me to the path of changing my mind on trade. And I've come around to this view that trade is, is not a principle, it's contextual. It's what's good for us in this moment. What's good for the United States, its citizenry, its communities, its industries, and so on in this moment. And there may come a time when you know, the wide open uh, uh, trading system that we championed around the world in the immediate post-World War II era is good for us again. But it isn't right now. I don't think. All of this stuff is contextual. That's what I say about prudence. Um, there's no easy answer to this. You have to come to it with a decent understanding of what you're trying to achieve, of what the good is, what the political good is. And then you have a debate with your fellow citizens, and you see who wins, and you see what gets enacted. So uh, one very other short anecdote. I, a couple of months ago, I, gave a, I was invited to give a talk to this small group of like high-achieving people in Washington. And they come in from around the country and they meet somewhere. I, don't, I think the speaker canceled. That's why. Oh yeah, I meant, to, I meant to say, what do you guys all, 
It's the all-star game, and you're here listening to me. I mean, what, did you not have tickets or something? Uh, I feel bad for you. So they invite me, and it's a bunch of like real Davos quality <laughs> oligarchs in here, right? None of them household names that I recognize, but everybody in there is in some like, you know, super rarefied position um, in a corporation or in the economy, and they hear me give my little spiel, and they're, of course, naturally terrified and horrified. <laughs> and um, so this one guy says to me, you know, well, but I run the tech company, and, San Bruno, and I can't hire, you know, and I said, well, have you tried paying them more? Well, you know, I, I, no, I, even at any price, I can't, and, you know, and then it, it goes down the street. So, you know, what are you saying? Because I had made the argument, we don't need more people. I don't think right now, 327 million in the United States does not at the moment have a pressing need for more people. And well, what am I supposed to do? So how do we decide this question? I said, if, if the regime operated the way it's supposed to operate, and you were Senator Smith and I were Senator Anton, we'd argue about this. We would debate it. You'd tell me why you thought it was necessary. I'd tell you why you thought it wasn't necessary. We'd see who could marshal the most votes. We would vote on it. We would make a political decision. You might win that argument. I might win that argument. I don't know. But that's not the ground on which we're arguing about it today. And that's what fundamentally needs to change. So in the, uh, in the present crisis, how can conservatives revitalize politics without, um, well, without falling into polarization? Well, I mean, polarization, what, amongst ourselves or with the left? I mean, we're already kind of polarized with the left, and they, their actions have a lot to do with that, and I don't think we're going to talk them out of it. So a certain amount of that is, if not necessary, inevitable, uh, and we just need to deal with it. And in fact, not let our, so one of the things I think conservatives do is they let themselves get talked into believing that polarization is evil. Well, what the left means is it's evil when you do it. So just back down and agree with us, right? Uh, I, that's the, and conserv there are a lot of high-minded conservatives who sort of think that way. Oh, we can't, you know, and it's, just, it's against my principle. Some polarization, politics is a fight. Um, I don't remember the Latin, but what's that, that line um, in Latin? Um, Aristotle is accustomed to seeking a fight, right? Um, gets, used to get quoted a lot. And the point is, when you're arguing about important true, you know, things, the, the, the noble and the good, the just, the true, the beneficial, people are going to draw lines, they're going to take sides, they're going to get mad at each other, and they're going to yell at each other. There's no avoiding it. You don't want it to come to violence, you don't want it to come to division, but if, um, you know, avoiding polarization is the highest good, uh, we're just going to keep on the trajectory that we're on, and I don't think that's good or going to end well. Thank you for, so much for speaking, Mr. Anton. <clears throat> when railing against the tyranny of expertise, you said we're losing a rhetorical war because we make, mistake policy for principle. It seems to me, though, that President Trump, President Trump won in 2016 in large part because of the list of proposed Supreme Court nominees, a list provided by expert legal, the expert legal establishment of conservatism, Inc., the Federalist Society. How do you account for the huge number of conservative voters who turned out explicitly because of that list? Because it was a Thank good you. list. <laughs> no, seriously, I'm not saying that there's, there, there's no, <laughs> I'm not saying there's no use for expertise. I mean, but you know, let's replace expertise with a more important fundamental word, wisdom, right? Expertise is a specific type of knowledge that claims to be wisdom, but that is not, right? Of course. You know, uh, we, always, we always want to be guided by wisdom, by the truth, by knowledge of what is good. Good judges are better than bad judges. I would turn to people who know a whole lot about judges before making judicial appointments, and I would listen to their advice. But, it's, but the, the, the fundamental point here is not that you don't listen to advice or that you don't listen to wisdom or that you don't gather and process information, right? You're not, you know, rejecting those things because you're anti-intellectual or you're just against knowledge. You're saying that your claim to expertise does not give you the final say. This is still a fundamentally political question. So to take it back to another one of those fundamental tensions I was talking about, in the final analysis, right, the, the, the classical argument is that the only just claim to rule is wisdom. And then they spend a lot of time undercutting that and showing you all the inherent contradictions and saying, well, that's never going to work. But you have to agree with them in principle. The only just title to rule is wisdom. If you know how to rule and I don't, if you're wise and I'm not, you should rule me. The founders make this point consistently in the Federalist Papers and elsewhere, where they say, if there were a perfect being, if God directly uh, governed the affairs of men, of course we would let him rule us as a, uh, without our consent, as a despot, or an angel, or something like that. But there's no human being who has that, 
We have to resolve these questions for ourselves. They remain fundamentally political and always will. That's just in the nature of man. Thank you. You talked uh, about the relationship between the universals and the particulars, and you said that it was important that we don't abandon the universals and simply try to make decisions based on particular issues. But in this talk, we've heard about the idea of protection and the good, and we're distancing ourselves away from traditional principled uh, movement conservatism in ideas like the need for liberty and virtue to be combined or um, in terms of natural rights. So if we're moving away from those and simply going after the good, how does that stay, how do we stay away from utilitarianism with that approach? Yeah, so Thank I'm you. not moving away from natural rights or liberty or virtue. I would argue that it's movement conservatism that's forgot how to properly interpret these things and link them together. Um, that, that's really my argument. When I say they replace uh, pr principle with policy, what I mean is to them, um, Policies that might be good, and that might, you know, I mean, a, a great example. I mean, a, a bedrock principle of the founding is the protection of property rights. Hugely important. As both, as a utilitarian measure, it makes the country, the, uh, a rich country is a stronger country. Uh, and as a moral measure, the government really shouldn't have the right to limit your ability to use your talents to the fullest, right? So they make the case um, both ways. Um, but from there, I think too many conservatives say, okay, we'll take that principle and you know, we're just going to say no, no limits on acquisition or on property rights can be ever set at all uh, and that because it's a principle. And so, you know, the argument against protectionism or free trade or against, you know, certain trade measures is one of the arguments made is, is not merely, they make a utilitarian argument, oh, this will never work. Um, despite the fact that it has worked in the past, doesn't mean it'll work now, but at least we know it has. But they also make a, a kind of what they think is a, is a moral argument, which is that um, this is somehow a government, inter an unjust government interference in property rights. Um, I, don't, I don't see it that way. I think that misunderstands what the, what the founding principles were and what these higher things that you're talking about are. That's my criticism. It's not that we're, ab we're abandoning natural right liberty. It's that we're trying to recover them and their proper relationship with one another against a movement that, if it ever really understood them, it maybe did 30 years ago, um, it doesn't seem to anymore. my best. Uh, thank you so much for speaking, sir. Um, you began your speech by talking about the Lincoln-Douglas debates and both candidates making arguments about history to try to convince their voters yes. of certain first principles. You have essentially said, tried to do that same thing today, making an argument about history of the founding to convince us of certain first principles. But Stephen Douglas was not convinced by Lincoln's argument, and there will likely be many conservatives who are not convinced by your argument. Count on it. Respectfully. I personally happen to agree with you. Uh, and even more so, be, there are many on the far right and the far left who say we need to reject the tradition of the founding mm -hmm. in general. So is there a way to speak about political values in a way that can convince other people who disagree with you without necessarily relying on the institution of history? Well, the first thing we need to do is not is just banish the word values from this context um, for reasons I can go into later. It gets a little abstruse. Um, so I, your, your question is, what, can we do this without appealing to history? Um, I mean, look, they're, 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 maybe, but why would you want to? It's a wonderful uh, arsenal, or sorry, tool in the rhetorical arsenal. So we can evaluate the founders on two bases. Well, more than two, but just to say, are their principles true? I have examined them um, with great diligence for a long time, and I believe they are. I certainly have not found a better alternative. Did they work out in practice? Did they deliver what they said they were going to deliver to us in all of the writings that they put out in justifying the revolution? They did. It worked. Um, and, and, and third, is it ours? Is it inspiring to us? Is it something that we can look back to? Remember, a sect or a republic, if it wishes to live long, must go back to its beginnings. We don't go back to the beginnings of Others, we, we, we go back to what's our own because it's part of a, 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 you know, human passion is to love one's own. It so happens that our own is good and we don't need to lose sight of it. We, we shouldn't lose sight of that. That's what I mean when I talk about the universal. But it's also our own. It's particular. So I, I, would, do them, I would use them both uh, in, the, in the rhetorical toolkit and do and will. I don't, I don't see how we gain anything by giving up the one or the other. That was the point I was trying to make at the end by um, some on the disgruntled right 
who get what's wrong with movement conservatism, but their view is ditch the principle uh, and just embrace the particular alone. That's not, ultimately, I don't think that's, that's going to work, and it's, and it's unnecessary. That's just a flip. That, so the, essentially, I think what they're arguing for is the flip side of what you maybe didn't argue for but asked about. 